Hello and welcome to all our friends out there joining us for Orange County Library System Summer Reading Livestream. My name is Jules and I will be your host. I want to take a moment and thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services and Window World of Central Florida for their generous donations and support. With their help, we are able to bring the summer reading program into your homes. This year, the summer reading program is completely online, and we've got great activities and events just like this one planned all summer long. If you haven't joined the challenge, there's still time. To join our summer reading program fun, you need to do a few things. One, sign up for a library card at ocls.info forward slash get your card. Two, join Beanstack by creating an account at ocls.beanstack.org. And three, register to attend our virtual events. There are so many to choose from. In addition to attending our virtual events, this year we are challenging you to read for at least 20 minutes every day this summer and keep track of your minutes by logging them in Beanstack or using one of our paper reading trackers. You can pick those up at any of our branch locations. Those who have read 300 minutes can get a goodie bag filled with fun stuff. And guess what? The time is now. If you're one of those friends who read 300 minutes, you can pick up a goodie bag at one of our branch locations today while supplies last. The fun doesn't stop there. Complete the challenge of reading for a total of 600 minutes by July 31st, and you'll be entered into the grand prize drawing. In fact, caregivers, any reading they've done this summer counts for that, so log it all. For more information about our summer reading program and to see our events calendar and check book recommendations, visit our website at OCLS dot info forward slash srp now be careful not to bat your eyes because you don't want to miss a second of this live stream we are hanging out with bat scientist and enthusiast donald solik donald's been researching these fascinating mammals for 26 years he is here to share the unusual and incredible adaptations and behaviors of bats if you have questions during the live stream type them into the chat for the question and answer session following our presentation now let's bring our wings together to welcome Donald. <laughs> Good day, everybody. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Jules. And thank you for inviting me to speak with you about bats today. So I'm Donald, and I love bats. I'm going to take this off now because it's a little warm to be wearing a winter hat today. Um, but uh, as Jules mentioned, I've been studying bats for many years. And today I'm really excited to share some of the things that I know about bats with you all. So I'm gonna be showing some uh, cool pictures and videos and telling you some fun stories about these wonderful creatures. Now, while I'm talking, if you have any questions, please, please, please type them into the chat or scribble them on a piece of paper so that when I'm done talking, I'll be able to answer them for you. And fair warning, I like to ask questions of you when I'm talking, um, but since we can't interact very well in this format, this is what we're going to do. When I ask you a question, I'm gonna wait a few moments to give you a chance to answer the question on your own, and then I'm gonna give you the answer anyway. Sound good? Good. So, to practice, here is my first question for you. Look at this image of a bat on your screen and tell me, is this what bats really look like? No, not at all. That's a Halloween bat. It's a fake bat. In the real world, Bats come in all shapes and sizes and colors and patterns, and none of them are solid black with glowing yellow eyes. So bats are found all over our planet, except in Antarctica, where it's too cold for them. And there are 1,406 different species of bats on this planet. The reason I know this is because that's the number on my friend's shirt. This is Dr. Nancy Simmons, and she is a director at the American Museum of Natural History. And one of her many jobs is to keep track of the number of bat species on this planet. When the number changes, she makes another shirt and wears it proudly. 
Her friend here is Dr. Winifred Frick, who is the chief scientist at Bat Conservation International and also one of my bosses. And one of her many jobs is to make sure this number on Nancy's shirt doesn't go down. So Nancy keeps track of the bats in, on this planet and Winifred helps protect the bats on this planet. Two amazing women scientists with great fashion sense. So we now know there's a lot of different types of bats on this planet. In Florida, where you live, there are 16 different types of bats. And here's five of them. We have the northern yellow bat, the gray bat, the eastern red bat, the silver-haired bat, and the big brown bat. Now, how do you think these bats got their names? That's right, these bats got their names by the colors of their fur. This guy up here is pretty yellow, this guy is gray, this guy, well, he looks kind of orange to me, but they call him a red bat, so we're going to call him a red bat too. This bat has silver highlights, and this bat is brown. So, because bats have fur, that makes them mammals, just like dogs and cats and guinea pigs and horses and orangutans and us. We're mammals too. Where's your fur? That's right, this is our fur. Hair is just another name for fur. So we're mammals and bats are mammals, but bats aren't just any mammals. Bats are the only mammals that can fly. And they do this using their hands, which sounds pretty weird. But check this out. Hold out your left hand with the thumb pointed up and compare it to this bat's outstretched wing. Up here at the top of the bat's wing is the bat's thumb. Along the edge of the wing here, it's harder to see, but the next two fingers are there. And then this long digit here, whoops, this long <laughs> bone here is the bat's ring finger. And this long digit here is the bat's pinky. So the rest of the wing is made up of the skin that's between your fingers that's been stretched really, really tight. So bats are literally flying around with the power of jazz hands. Speaking of hands and wings, the hands holding the bat wing in this photo are my daughters. Okay. So. This is the giant flying fox. And you can do the same thing with its wings. Up here is the thumb. Along the edge of the wing are the next two fingers that are hard to see. Here's its ring finger, and here's the bat's pinky. Now this is the largest bat in the world. It has a wingspan that's as wide as I am tall. Now, you can't see me really well, but I'm pretty tall. I'm a little over six feet. So that's a lot of bat. In Florida, you happen to have one of the largest bats in the United States. And it's this guy here, the Florida bonneted bat. His wingspan is this wide. So that's a lot of bat too. So they call him the Florida bonneted bat because these ears on the top of his head, I guess, make it look like he's wearing a baby's bonnet, which is kind of cute. Uh, this bat is also, it's an endangered species and it's only found in Florida. So you might get lucky sometime and step outside your house at dusk and look at the night sky. And if you see a large bat flying by, it might be one of these large rare bats. So those are big bats. Here's a small bat. This is the bumblebee bat. And she is the smallest bat in the world. She actually weighs less than a penny. Super cute, super tiny. So now I have another question for you. 
Are bats blind? No, not at all. Bats can see just as well as you or I can. And some, like this flying fox, have these huge eyes that they use to find their food in the dark, which for this bat is fruit. So here's another flying fox that's munching on some fruit that it found. Note the large eyes there and the partially eaten fruit here. And here's a flying fox that stuffed its face with fruit. I think a better name for him might be a flying pig. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. This is Raffinesque's big-eared bat. And he's another species that you have in Florida. Now, if the flying fox we just saw uses its huge eyes to find its food in the dark, what sense do you think this bat uses to find its food in the dark? That's right. This bat uses its huge ears to listen for its food, which for this bat is insects. Now, this bat can see just fine. There's its eye. But it would be pretty hard to fly around at high speeds in the dark and try and catch small insects, right? So. Bats with big ears will use them in one of two ways in order to listen for insects. Some, like this pallid bat, which is my very favorite bat and is found only in the Western United States, uh, pallid bats will use their big ears when they're flying along to listen for the footsteps of scorpions. And when they hear a scorpion walking along on the ground, they'll swoop down on it and grab it on the ground, just like this bat has done here. So here's a scorpion in its mouth, and uh, here's its legs, here's the scorpion tail, and there's a scorpion stinger. Now, you might be concerned that the scorpion tries to sting the bat, and it does, but the joke is on the scorpion because pallid bats are immune to scorpion venom which means it doesn't hurt them when they get stung. So, such a cool bat. Other bats with large ears, like this evening bat, which is also found in Florida, they use echolocation to find their insect prey. The way they do this is a bat will fly along and it'll make a sound like a and that sound will travel out into the night sky and it will bounce off things it runs into like buildings or trees or people or moths. The bat will then use its large ears to listen for the echoes coming back and it will analyze those echoes to create a mental image or a sound picture of the world around it, which is pretty cool. Have you ever played the game Marco Polo? So for those of you who haven't played Marco Polo, this is how it works. It's usually played by a bunch of kids in a swimming pool where one kid is it. And that kid has to close their eyes and search around to try and find their friends to tag them so that they can be it. Now, the rule of this game is the kid that's it with his eyes closed, if he ever says, Marco, then all the other kids, even though they're trying to hide from him, they have to respond with Polo. And the kid who's it tries to listen for those Polos to figure out where their friend is so they can tag them. Bats are basically playing a giant game of Marco Polo with the universe. And they're pretty good at it. So let's see this in action. I'm gonna play you a video of a big brown bat, one of your Florida species, catching a moth. Now, this video was taken in a completely pitch dark room. The reason we can see it is because it was taken using an, an infrared camera. So we can see what's going on, but the bat in this room can't see anything. So I'm about to play it 
And also this video has been slowed down so that we can see it really well and hear it well. So here we go. This is how a big brown bat attacks a non-clicking moth. You can see. They come with a natural catcher's mitt. Yeah. So hopefully you're able to see and hear that. Um, but yeah, that shows how bats use echolocation to find insects in the dark, which is pretty cool. Because bats love to eat insects like moths, and they've been doing this for millions and millions of years. But moths don't like to be eaten. <laughs> so for millions of years, some moths have evolved certain defenses against bats. So they'll know when a bat is flying around. Some moths, like this guy here, have developed ears that are tuned to the sound of bat echolocation. Now, you might think that the ears for this moth are these antennae up here, uh, but they're not. The antennae are used for a different function. This moth's ears are little small microscopic holes that are located under the wing. We can't really see them in this picture, but we can imagine them. So when this moth with these ears is flying along at night, if it hears an echolocating bat, it will tuck its wings and drop immediately to the ground as a way to evade any bats that might be flying around, which is a pretty good defense. Of course, some bats have figured out a way around that defense. And that's what this next video is gonna show. So this is gonna be a video of a Eastern red bat, which is another Florida species. And check this out. The little red bat that we videotaped makes a basket with its tail membrane right under the dropping insect. And so by coming in and doing this little circus flip, he defeats the dropping mechanism. Oh. Wow, how wild is that? So these bats are literally doing somersaults to catch their food. Uh, you might say that they are real acrobats. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> so bats really like to eat insects. Um, and here's a bat that has a moth in its mouth. This, this one is called the free-tailed bat, which is another species you have in Florida. And there's a lot of cool things about free tail bats, but well, one, one reason they're called free tail bats, by the way, is because their tail hangs down freely like this. So yeah, again, bat names are super easy, which is another reason I love them. But another reason free tail bats are cool is because they like to form really large groups of bats, which we call colonies. The largest colony of bats is located in a cave in Texas called Bracken Cave. And this cave holds 20 million of those free-tailed bats. I don't know how well you can see it on your screen, but every square inch of this cave is covered in little tiny bat bodies. And this is only a portion of the cave. So that's a lot of bats. And they make a lot of bat guano or bat poop. These two scientists here are standing next to a large pile of bat poop. <laughs> and here's a fun story. Um, a while back, my daughter and I visited a cave that had large piles of bat guano, and we would uh, sled down them. You know, like if you were sledding down a snowy hill, we would sled down these, these piles of guano, which was, Kind of gross, but it was a, a lot of fun. So bats make so much poop because they eat so many insects. This is a Southeastern bat, another Florida species. I think this, this is the 10th one I've shown you so far of the bats that live in Florida. And he's got a, ma a moth in his mouth. And this bat, is capable of eating half of its body weight of, in insects every single night that it goes out to forage. Now think about that. I weigh 200 pounds. 
It used to be less, but I blame COVID. But that means that if I was a bat, that means that I would have to go out and eat 100 pounds of insects every single night. Yuck. I mean, wow. That's a lot of insects. Now, of course, bats don't weigh 200 pounds. Um, this southeastern bat weighs about 10 grams. So half of its body weight is about a nickel. So this bat will go out and eat about a nickel's worth of insects every single night. Which doesn't sound like much until you remember or think about that Bracken Cave bat colony we just saw, where every single night, every single one of those 20 million bats is going to leave the cave and go out and eat about a nickel's worth of insects every single night. Now I've done the math for you. And what that means is that cave, Bracken Cave, those bats will go out and eat 110 tons of insects every single night. Another way to think about that is they are eating 22 elephants worth of insects every single night. And that's just one species of bat and one colony in a small part of Texas. So if you think about all of the insect eating bats in the world, they are doing us a pretty good service by eating so many insects at night. Bats are the main predators of nighttime insects like mosquitoes, which nobody really likes. Um, they also will eat lots of beetles and moths that are pests for uh, our crops and forests. So take home messages, without bats, our night skies would be a lot buggier which would not be that great for our health or the health of our crops and forests. So let's switch gears here a little bit. Um, we've been talking about insect eating bats and most of the bats in Florida eat insects. But there are a few that sometimes show up in Florida like this Jamaican fruit bat. And as his name implies, he eats fruit, not insects. But they also perform a really important role. So this single bat, when he's fe feeding on fruit each night, he will eat about 60,000 seeds, right? So he'll eat the fruit, he'll digest it. And what happens then is when this bat will leave to fly and find another fruit to eat, it will end up pooping out these seeds on the ground, basically raining seeds as it flies around. And the, each of these seeds is going to be encapsulated in a little bit of bat guano, which is a really great fertilizer. So these fruit bats are basically replanting our forests when they fly around at night, um, which is a very good thing to do. This is another type of bat that can sometimes show up in Florida. But before I give you his name, uh, we're going to try to guess to see what this bat might eat. So this bat's eyes are pretty small. Remember that large eye, bats with large eyes tend to eat fruit. So this bat probably doesn't eat fruit. This bat's ears are pretty small too. And remember that bats with big ears tend to eat insects. So this bat probably doesn't eat insects or fruit. This bat has a large a large nose or muzzle. And the bat uses this large, large nose to eat its food, which for this bat is nectar. This is a blossom bat. And they use this long nose to fit inside flowers so that they can get at the tasty nectar at the base of the flower. And some Nectar feeding bats have long tongues in order to reach that tasting nectar at the base of the flower. And some nectar feeding bats have really long tongues to reach that tasting nectar at the base of flowers. You're looking at probably the, the world record holder of tongue length right there, that tiny little bat. Pretty impressive. So when a nectar feeding bat visits a flower, 
one thing that happens is it'll get caked in pollen dust. That's what all the, the yellow dust is on this bat, right? And then when this bat then leaves that flower to go find another flower to drink its nectar, some of that pollen dust will fall off on that new flower and it will pollinate that flower. So just like birds and bees and butterflies, bats are really important for pollination. In fact, more than 500 different plants on this planet depend on bats for pollination, including a few that you've probably heard of, like bananas. This is a banana flower here, a clump of bananas up there. Uh, mangoes are another bat pollinated plant. And then there's a lot of other tropical species you probably aren't familiar with, like guava and agave and so on. Okay. To finish up my talk, I'm going to talk about a type of bat that is not found in Florida. And that's this cute little bat here, which is the common vampire bat. And she drinks blood. Which might sound a little creepy, but it's super cool how vampire bats drink blood. They almost have like superpowers. And so what happens is a vampire bat, to start off with, their hearing is tuned to the sounds of heavy breathing, like a snoring animal. And so this bat is going to be listening for the sounds of a sleeping animal. And then vampire bats are one of the few bat species that's really good at walking on the ground. So this bat will land a few feet away and it'll tiptoe or tip wing over to a sleeping animal. In, in this case, it's a sleeping dog. Then the bat has these heat sensors in the sides of its nose that can tell it where the blood is closest to the surface of the skin basically telling it where a good place to bite might be. The vampire bat then has super sharp teeth that it uses to make a small little cut. And these teeth are so sharp that this sleeping dog doesn't even realize it's been bitten. And then lastly, vampire bats have um, something in their saliva called an anticoagulant, which means it's a blood thinner. So after they make a bite, it causes the blood of the dog to flow freely from the wound. So the bat can then just sit back and lap up the flowing blood like a kitten drinking milk from a bowl. A pretty gruesome kitten, but a um, uh, cool kitten nonetheless. So with that image, I just want to thank you for your time and your attention. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, stay batty. And I'm going to end my stop sharing right there. Okay. still muted sorry here we go that was amazing i have to say i thought i knew a lot about bats but i'm sure i'm echoing the thoughts of all our viewers out there and wow they are so fascinating so we got a couple of questions and we're going to share those with you um, our first one are bats related to birds ah that's an excellent question are bats related to birds so a lot of people think that they're related to birds because they fly, right? But, uh, but no, bats are not related to birds. They're very different animals. Um, they both just have figured out ways to fly. Birds obviously have feathers. Um, they don't have fur like mammals do and bats are covered with fur. Good question. Ah, I see a, another question there. Um, do you want to read it, Jules, or should I sure. just answer? Uh, let's read it quick in case um, anybody's having a problem seeing it. Um, can you talk about bat houses? Um, 
it looks like someone's looking at getting one for their yard. Uh, yeah. So bat houses, they're a really good way to help um, uh, uh, protect bats because one of the issues that bats are having is they're losing a lot of their habitat. So if we can put up a bat house in our yard, that might give bats another place to live. Um, they can be tricky though. I'll be honest with you. Um, you know, when you put up a bat house, you may, it may not be successful right away. Not like a bird feeder or a bird house where birds will move right in or eat the food right away. So it's important to do a few things when you're putting up a bat house is you want to do a little bit of research and figure out a good place in your yard where you can put it up about 10 to 15 feet off the ground and facing south because that's where it'll get the most solar exposure. Bats like to be warm when they're in their bat house. And then you probably also want to paint it um, a good color. In Florida, you don't want to paint it black because you'll get really crispy bats <laughs> um, if, if it's too warm. So you probably want to paint it a, more of a light brown in Florida. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you just sit back and wait and hope that you get lucky. It, it helps if you've seen bats flying around in your backyard or if you live in an area that has trees and water. That tends to really help your success in attracting bats. So hopefully that was helpful. How much blood does a vampire bat drink in a night? Yes, that is a good question. I'm glad I looked that up just before I started talking <laughs> today. Um, vampire bats will drink um, about, uh, I guess it depends, but five grams of blood a night, um, which might sound like a lot, but um, you know that again, that's about the, the amount of a nickel. And they, they don't usually drink that from a single animal. But even if they did, that's not a lot of blood. Like if you give or donate blood to the hospital, or even when your doctor draws blood from you, they're, they're taking a lot more blood than a vampire bat will take. Um, so, uh, yes. Do you like to discover bats? Oh, I love to discover bats. And every, I mean, even though I've been doing this, like Jules said, for like 26 years and every day I still learn something new about them. And, and I love that because they are, to me, bats are kind of like science fiction. You know, they're, 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 they're stranger than fiction. They do these really weird, bizarre things and um, learning about them is always uh, so entertaining. So I encourage you to learn as much more as you can. This, this is a small taste today about um, the uh, uh, cool things, some of the cool things that bats do. What should I do if I find a bat? That is a good question. So, and this is important. Um, if you find a bat that's like on the ground or something, chances are that bat is sick because it's not flying away from you like a normal bat would. Um, and so if you ever find a bat on the ground, just leave it alone, okay? And that goes for any wild animal that you find. Just to, don't don't touch wild animals because some of them can, can, can carry diseases that might not be very uh, safe for you. Um, it, some bats do carry rabies, which is a very fatal virus. Um, most bats don't, it's only maybe less than 1% of all bats actually carry rabies. But if you find a bat on the ground that's not moving along, chances are he might be a sick bat with rabies. So you definitely do not want to touch him. So if you ever see a bat on the ground, either just ignore it, leave it alone, or uh, uh, find an adult who will hopefully call animal control or someone like me to come over and make sure the bat is okay. Where could we go to see and possibly hold a bat? Ooh, where could you go to see? Well, so definitely you can go to the zoo. Uh, most zoos will have bats in their displays, usually a fruit bat, uh, fruit bats, um, like the large flying foxes with the big eyes that I showed early on, um, because those guys are a lot easier to keep in captivity. Um, in terms of holding a bat safely, <laughs> um, you would have to go uh, find someone like me who might be going out to capture bats. And when we do that, um, we're always welcome to, well, 
mostly welcome to have visitors along who we can then, um, you know, show them bats and we can safely um, let them pet the bat in our hands, maybe something like that. Um, but until you yourself have uh, rabies shots, then it's still not safe for you to even hold a bat. Are all bats nocturnal? That's an excellent question. I would say the, the vast majority of them are nocturnal and they'll do most of the things um, that they need to do at night. But if you go to some like islands in the South Pacific, you'll see bats flying around in the sky like we see turkey vultures flying around here. They're just soaring on the thermals. So bats are mostly nocturnal. Um, they tend to do their feeding at night, um, but they can, they can come out and be active during the day sometimes. And have you seen one during the day? I have. I have seen bats during the day. It's, it's not very common. Um, so it's interesting when you see one during the day, because like, wow, what the heck? <laughs> You're out of context. Um, uh, but yeah, usually when you see them during the day, it's because it's either really close to dusk and some bats just like to get out a little early. Um, or maybe because they're, they're where they live was disturbed. So one time I was, I was rock climbing and as I was climbing these rocks, I heard some squeaks and a little crack. And then this little bat face popped out and he, you know, then flew off, which I felt bad about. It's like, oh, I disturbed you at, at, at your home. But uh, uh, I'm certain he came back a little later when, when I was done climbing on the rocks there. <laughs> uh, we're kind of shortening in one of our, our longer questions. Um, uh, how do we go about finding someone to notify if um, there are bats in our, our neighborhood um, that maybe need to be transported to a different location? Or Right. Um, I mean, your, your, your best bet is to call uh, your local animal control, um, maybe your local, your, your county animal control. Um, there are, however, there is a website out there that um, catalogs uh, different bat rehabilitators in your area. And these are people who care for bats, any sick or injured bats that they that people find. They'll bring them into uh, their facility and, um, and, 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 and try and get that bat back out <laughs> of their facility um, uh, healthier. Um, and so, yeah, the best thing to do is try and search uh, on Google for a local bat rehabilitator um, and, um, and I can send a link to you guys after this, which maybe you'll have available that will contain that information as well. Um, and uh, do bats lay eggs? Uh, um, no, bats are mammals and, um, most mammals do not lay eggs, uh, Platypus kind of do, but they're weird. They're weird mammals. But no, um, bats give live birth. And what's crazy is they'll do this um, to them upside down. So you know, bats you usually see them hanging upside down to us, um, but that's not a good way to give birth to a bat baby. So what they'll do is they'll, when they're about to give birth, they'll rotate around and hang by their thumbs from like a branch or something. And then when the baby is born, they'll catch it between their legs in that, that tail membrane that a lot of bats have. Um, kind of the same way that we saw it catch insects. They'll, they'll catch their newborn in their little tail membrane and, um, and yeah, not, not an egg form. <laughs> How do bats mate? <laughs> bats will mate pretty much the same way uh, dogs do or cats do. Um, yeah. <laughs> And they'll, 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 they'll do it pretty quickly. <laughs> they, they usually, what's interesting about bats too, is they, they'll, they'll mate during the winter. At least our bats around here in, in Florida and in the United States, they will mate during the winter. And then the female, when it comes out of, uh, we didn't talk about hibernation at all, but when they um, come out of hibernation in the spring, then they will be pregnant and ready to give birth to their offspring right away. Uh, just because I'm curious, what do we call a baby bat? Uh, a baby bat is called a pup, which I think is just, you know, that's that's cute. Bat pups. Uh, 
I think that's the perfect note to end this on. I'm so excited how many people had questions for us today. And I want to thank you, Donald, for joining us today. Um, this was fascinating. I've learned so much about bats to share with all of my friends and family now. So let's give a big hand and thank Donald for sharing so much with us about bats. And for more batty information, visit our Bat Scientist website at um, www.batacousticsurveys.com forward slash outreach. And I want to thank all of you at home for joining us today. We have more fun events that are live planned every Tuesday starting at 2 p.m. So make sure to join us next week because we're going to be featuring Gatorland. You can also find um, more information on all of our upcoming events at ocls.info forward slash SRP. And don't forget to track your reading and activities in Beanstack because there's still time. I'm rooting for you and your friends to win some awesome prizes. And finally, we'd love to have your feedback about our virtual event. Please complete our survey in English or Spanish at your convenience at ocls.info forward slash survey. Thanks again for joining us today and we'll see you next time. Bye. Introducing Orange County Library System Summer Reading Program. Get ready to join the Summer Reading Challenge. Here's what to do. Find great books on our summer reading book lists. Read at least 20 minutes every day. Sign up for Beanstack and log your minutes online. Complete fun challenges in Beanstack to earn badges. You can also log your minutes using the paper reading tracker. Complete the challenge by July 31st for your chance to win awesome grand prizes like bicycles, laptops, science kits, games, art sets, scooters, and more. Grand prizes generously brought to you by Window World of Central Florida. Visit ocls.info slash SRP or call 407-835-7323. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to be the first to find out when we have new fun and informative videos for you. Orange County Library System is your place to learn, grow, connect.